Thank you all for coming today. I want to call this meeting of the Governance Committee to order. Um, we have a lot of guests today, so um, I'm going to first do the roll and then ask everyone to go around and introduce themselves so that um, people at home and anyone watching later is aware of who all is here. Um, so, Councillor Tabor. As noted. <laughs> Councillor Lombardi. Here. And I'm Councillor Cook, and I'm present. Um, so uh, let's go around the room. I'm going to start here to my left. And um, everyone, please introduce yourself and tell us um, who you're representing. Peter Lachlan, representing or be on, here on behalf of the Trees and Greenery Committee. Tom Watson, uh, here on behalf of the Prescott Park Master Plan Implementation Committee. Uh, my name is Carl Diemer. I'm the chairman of the Ports of City Recreation uh, Board and Department, and uh, glad to be here. Mm -hmm. um, Barbara McMillan, the uh, Portsmouth Conservation Commission. Barbara, can you move a microphone? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> okay. um. Michael Griffin, Trees and Greenery Commission, and also on the Cemetery Commission. Um, so, um, we have a lot of guests today because we're continuing a discussion, the first item under our agenda, under old business, uh, the parks discussion. And we started this discussion just for history about a year ago. Um, and that discussion centered on discussing all of our committees and what we should um, be looking at um, for committees for the city. Where do we have gaps? but also um, what committees do we have that are no longer in operation. So we went through a comprehensive look um, in this committee at all of those, uh, eliminated committees that weren't operating, <coughs> and then we had questions around what do we need. Um, and I raised the issue of a parks discussion uh, because the city has several different um, departments that are responsible for parks and several different committees that have different responsibilities with regard to parks. And so the question I had was, who do we have um, at the citizen level that's taking a comprehensive look at strategic planning around parks and open spaces? So, um, so you will recognize everyone here that you all have individual roles in that, and your committees have individual roles in that. Uh, but this committee was trying to think, okay, so who who does the bigger strategic plan on where do we have new park spaces um, in the city? Um, where do we have passive recreation opportunities for individuals in the city? Um, where do we not have recreation? And part of that's conservation <coughs> commission is you know focused on conservation, but where do we identify spaces that maybe we don't want to develop in the future um, for parks or for open spaces? And, and to think more broadly around that in the same way that the Prescott Park Master Plan thinks about strategic planning for one park in the city. So, um, so we've invited you all here to share your thoughts. Um, we've already spoken with all the departments in the city that we thought had a stake in parks and work directly in our parks and asked them what their viewpoints were on you know, who really should have that overarching master planning view around parks um, and so uh, but we really wanted to hear from you because you all sit and chair the committees um, that are responsible for this so um, I would be happy if, if whoever wants to chime in first on your thoughts on uh, bigger parks discussion at the city level and and how what what our next steps should be <coughs> anyone and this can be a very informal discussion. So um, we're just gathering ideas still, trying to d make a decision. Yes. I'll start. Um, this is uh, first I've heard about the uh, Parks Committee. Um, it's when you sent uh, me the email and the invite, which I appreciate very much. Um, in, in the past years, just to give everybody a little bit of history, um, the Recreation Department has been kind of tasked with um, the park utilization, how they're going to be uh, taken care of, and um, what type of activities would go on in the different parks, mm -hmm. as well as the fields and also the buildings. Um, the thing about uh, the parks, we've typically had uh, somebody from the DPW sit on the uh, recreation board um, 
to help communicate uh, repairs or maintenance or you know some ideas of what they could do to uh, keep them in uh, very good working order. Um, in the past, we've had um, uh, Everett Kern and um, uh, Mr. Croto. And uh, they would come to the boards uh, periodically, <clears throat> once a month, and uh, they would be able to report out to us the overall condition of the parks uh, and the fields, of course, and also the buildings, because they have a close relationship with taking care of those things. And then we would go ahead and, as a group, as a recreation board, we would make decisions of what needed most attention first. And, um, and that would typically be uh, something that we'd open up to uh, any public input or somebody wanted something uh, taken care of at a certain field. Um, I've had you know, everything from basketball courts to, you know, uh, pocket parks, uh, things like that down South Street, um, all those things that the public could come and, uh, you know, uh, give their uh, recommendations or suggestions of how to repair it. So we typically would go through and uh, communicate that to the DPW and make sure everybody's in agreement with that, you know. So it's um, to the benefit of the citizens of uh, Portsmouth on, on those. Uh, because we also had to do, uh, we do some programming on some of the parks uh, for recreation purposes, whether it be adult <coughs> or, or uh, children, you know. So that's where we've been at for the past uh, years, you know, since the beginning. Thank you. Yes. If I can then pick up and add to a couple of the threads here, um, just so everyone's aware, the Recreation Board, you can find it established under uh, Chapter 1, Section 1.304, Recreation Board. Um, and <coughs> it's a very short ordinance. Um, and it speaks of the functions of the Recreation Board shall perform the following, assist the Recreation Director in planning a citywide recreation program, and advise the City Manager in regard to recreational policy. Mm -hmm. So it's that short. <laughs> so that's its, uh, its mission, so to speak. Right. Um, I also think it might be uh, helpful for us all to keep in mind that we will very shortly have a completed recreational needs study um, I know the, the draft document is being finalized, uh, having reviewed it this weekend. Um, and so I think uh, both the rec board and the, um, and the city council will be seeing the results of that recreational needs study soon. And I know the recreation board and uh, the rec department were very instrumental in getting that launched and moving. It does cover passive recreation right. uses, which I know is, is that as well as the programming element. So I think you will as a collectively all find that um, the reports of that at least helpful in this ongoing conversation and potential next steps. And I, I think it may just be like a couple weeks out. Literally, it's very close. Um, so I, I don't know if it's on one of your agendas yet, but yes. I think there's even a work, maybe it's a work session with the city council, but I know it's coming and it's very close. Um, so. Right, and uh, we're very anxious to see it too. We had uh, performed one in 2010, which had uh, given us all an uh, inventory of our assets uh, as far as fields, locations, buildings, uh, all that stuff, and also parks. Uh, which That was very, very, very helpful. And uh, so now we've done an update here in 2023 so that um, hopefully that report will come out just prior to the March 6th. Um, meeting and we're looking for a work session uh, with the City Council uh, for discussion uh, about some recreational activities and some ideas that we've been working on for the past year or two uh, which includes you know the successfully we put down one field already um, which is the unofficial turf field uh, out at the uh, campus and uh, and there's some continued uh, efforts to work on some additional recreational things that we want to do so yeah, we are looking for that, and hopefully March 6th, we can get that all put together. Wonderful. So, yeah, and it'll be good for everybody to know that, uh, because it will give you a kind of an inventory of what's out there right now. Because it's hard, you know, we don't drive by every park every day. 
right? Mm -hmm. So you know, we'd be surprised what, where the park, some of these parks are, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So it's good. Well, thank you, Council Lombardi. Um, yeah, I would. One of the reasons we wanted to pull this together is um, that, um, <clears throat> and we know recreation. You have an incredibly busy, strong committee. Um, one of our concerns was um, for the um, the health of some of these places that are um, not necessarily recreation um, oriented. Uh, the conservation committee, the trees. Um, I think the the health <clears throat> the health of some of these spots that have either actual paths or or animal paths going through them um, that people use um, for passive re recreation uh, need to be looked at and um, maintained and um, make sure that those those pieces are are all healthy and so it's one of the reasons why we were trying to get a larger group together to discuss that mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Councillor. Um, May I ask a question? Yes. <clears throat> did, did your need survey cover passive recreation like trails, walking trails, and things of that nature? It was, uh, it was targeted on there to uh, look at um, the parks, uh, not so much new trails, but anything existing that would be in place right now. Mm -hmm. But nothing, you know, going forward, we no planning. Because we didn't want to plan, or we were, you know, not want to get ahead of ourselves with planning with until we had all the assessment back and everything. Yeah, no, <clears throat> and I, I know you did, had a survey that went out. I have to admit I didn't complete it. So, yeah. but I'm, I'm just wondering when you were polling the citizens <clears throat> for what they wanted to see more of, or or right. better, or whether it included things that were outside the organized park system. Yeah, to say the yeah so we, we opened it up to uh, everything, uh, you know, everything from uh, Frisbee golf to uh, ice hockey, you know, went to a broad range. And if somebody had an idea, you know, put it down. Uh, trails are, you know, pretty important. Uh, I've, I've um, looked at trails out in the bog. Uh, I've also looked at uh, trails, you know, anywhere we could around the city uh, would it be an opportunity. Um, and there is, there is some opportunities there. Uh, that we can put some nice safe trails in play um, and uh, accessible, you know, so you don't have to walk a mile to go walk two miles, you know. So, uh, so we, 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 you know, we, we have looked at that and then the rail trail as well in conjunction with that. So there are some things, you know, that we could certainly do and at a, at a, um, a reasonable cost too, I might add. Yeah, you know, we could do those, those things. Uh, we could do it with volunteers too. Know. So I know we've done one out in the urban forest that we did uh, a while back, although that's not our property, but we did a trail out there uh, that the scouts did. You know, it was, a, it was all volunteer work, you know, so good. So, Tabor, did you have a question? Well, I was just going to ask our guests, um, you know, this last year, we added a new park. We added McEachern Park over on the North Mill Pond. Um, and when you go through all the master plans, the last two, all the citizen input says we want to keep finding green space. We want to add to the city's inventory of green space. Um, and I think there's opportunities on the north side of the Mill Pond. Is that, you know? property changes hands and um, gets developed but you know from your point of view who's the advocate in the city uh, amongst our committees for you know sort of looking around saying where's more green space we can add where's the next McEachern Park um, and that was one of the questions we were wrestling with Maybe Barbara, maybe that's Conservation Commission. Yeah. Um, but I think cities that are successful um, 
making green space part of their master planning, there's some person or entity that's always saying, um, where can we grab a hold of some more green space, whether it's a citizen who wants to donate it, whether it's a city purchase. Um, so I put that question out there. Yeah, and I, I mean, I can speak to that. I can give a little history to microphone. On that. If you move Make closer to the microphone, just. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. We used to sit here, now we don't sit here anymore. Um, so, to give a little history on that, we, as a conservation commission, is part of our purview is to, to work on that. So, and that's through state statute, really. I mean, it's one of the. It's not one of the required responsibilities we have, but it's one of the recommended ones, and it's one that a lot of other conservation <laughs> commissions do focus on, and we, we are focusing on that. So, um, I mean, it's like Dover has an open lands committee, and, you know, in Hampton and Exeter, they all work on that and have conservation easements. So, um, and the history really is that originally, um, like the Great Bog, was really done through the environmental planner and the conservation commission and other people in Portsmouth and other organizations. So that is a piece of property that has been, it's got a conservation easement on it with a lot of partners. Um, and there's other ones in the city in addition to that, there's some around um, Sagamore Creek and the, that kayak landing that you see over in Sagamore Creek is another one. There's a little island in Sagamore Creek that we purchased. So the Hidden gem. Yeah, so, and these are usually easements. And so we've been, the history really is 10 years ago, or actually 2010, we had a public undeveloped lands assessment done. So it was a natural resource inventory of what was going on in the whole city of Portsmouth and all of the lands that really are city owned, but not developed. Um, there was also some inclusion of some things like um, cemeteries and things like that, but it was some hidden gems out there that people don't know about, little ones, big ones, really great assessment that's extremely comprehensive and we have it online. It includes maps, it includes um, recommendations, it's looking at all those things like invasive species and is, is there a homeless population, is there a lot of trash there, is there dumping? Um, are there trails? Are there opportunities? Are there wildlife corridors on there? Are there opportunities to tie in with the rail trail? Um, and also opportunities to tie in with neighborhood groups and people that might use that area for walking or other trails. So, and then th that was done by West Environmental and then they had management suggestions and recommendations a huge inventory with the maps and the, those recommendations and a, um, a bunch of data. And then in 2020, we did an open space plan that kind of built off of that, and we hired another um, consultant, Resilience Planning and Design, and they did that open space plan, taking all that information that we had existing and coming up with new recommendations on what maybe to, to secure or purchase as an easement or as a piece of property to make even better connectivity and tie-ins and um, and that was a really strong public process that was really based on you know I think presenting to the concert to the um, to the City Council and being at different opportunities all throughout the city to have the public give their input on that and they included schools cemeteries um, all the parks um, so they had everybody as part of that process looking a lot at trails and other recommendations on that. And then lately what we've done is we were we did uh, submit a letter to the city council and then I presented a couple times to the planning board and the city council to talk about um, securing some funds through the CIP to have some set aside for us because we have partnered with the city a lot on this planning process and they've helped us create maps to actually figure out what's available and what's out there. and. Um, and so to have the funding ready helps us. The, I don't know if people know, but current use funding is the funding that comes out of um, the larger par parcels that were in current use, and usually the conservation commissions in New Hampshire get that funding for this particular purpose, and then the city council would grant us the authority or has the authority to, to grant the funds to be used. But we were prioritizing lots of different properties 
using these documents mm -hmm. and came up with maps. And I don't know if you had seen one of those maps. We have a whole bunch of maps looking at each piece of property. Um, so it's really something that we take seriously. We've put a lot of ducks in row to make it work. Um, and we're sort of on the cusp of, you know, getting some more properties either as easements or purchases for the city. So, and with everybody's blessing, of course, and, <laughs> and input. And, and uh, two, with a new master plan coming out, it seems like this is a really good time for us to be thinking about this and taking it seriously. So I don't know if that helps a little bit. Um, thank you. It actually does help quite a bit. Um, and that's exactly, I think, why this discussion came up here around we have a master planning process that's coming. And the question is, who's thinking about this comprehensive view of parks and open spaces and, and like the long term plan for the city and making sure that gets incorporated fully into the next master planning process so that we're not waiting another 15 years before a neighborhood that doesn't have a park has a, has a new park or before we connect uh, spaces where you ha can have hiking trails or connect to the rail trail. You know, who who is doing this and making sure that someone is thinking, I think, very broadly about um, that bigger piece of planning so that can feed in to that yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's interesting to hear what others are doing, too, because we had, we had done a volunteer effort, too, where we, we were putting together sort of a management plan for um, volunteers to come in and actually go out and uh, look at the properties, survey the properties. We were doing that on our own because um, a lot of them have, some of them have easements that have to be surveyed. And um, we were learning a ton about these properties by each of us taking different groups of properties and going out and walking them and checking them out. So we were coming up with this whole volunteer program to get people involved in, in sort of a citizen science kind of project where they would go out and we would provide guidance on how to do that to assess the properties. And so there's, yeah, there's a ton of mm. opportunity. That's very helpful. Um, I will say I also wanted to, to let everyone here know that the committee hasn't prejudged what our what any recommendation would be coming out of the committee. That's why we got all of you together. And the recommendation might be that it's helpful just to get all of you together mm -hmm. a few times to have these discussions. But um, but you know it's a range of things. It could be anything. But that's why we're asking you guys to be here and kind of share your thoughts and share what you do, um, so that the committee can make a, a more informed recommendation. So, um, just go ahead. If I can, maybe, um, if I can give a little history on the Prescott Park process. Um, so traditionally, until 2017, uh, Prescott Park, uh, even though it was a city park, city owned, uh, it was actually governed by the trustees of trust funds, which made the trustees in Portsmouth unique among New Hampshire trustees. I think it, we're the only ones who actually had something to do with other than managing money. Uh, and uh, that process uh, had the trustees not only managing the Prescott Sisters Trust Fund and the various other city trust funds, but also making policies on Prescott Park interacting with the uh, stakeholders such as the Arts Festival and the Art <coughs> Association and the, and the uh, Gundalow Company. And, uh, <clears throat> and then in 2016, the city undertook a, a full master plan evaluation and process uh, for the park. And th there is a fairly comprehensive plan that was adopted in, uh, dis in uh, propounded by the commission, uh, the committee in December, and then adopted by the city council <coughs> in January of 2017. And that uh, master planning process was not just a park redesign; it was a park governance uh, master plan. And uh, the result of that was that the governance was uh, transferred from the city, from the trustees of trust funds, to the city manager's office, and it has sat there ever since. There was a second step in that process uh, almost immediately after the uh, master plan was approved by the city council, a uh, blue ribbon uh, com uh, committee or task force was set up to adopt policies for Prescott Park. And there is a, uh, a separate uh, multi-page document that uh, deals with every issue you can think about in the operation of the park. Uh, 
covering everything from the type of license agreements we do with the stakeholders to uh, setting the tone on the type of activities that would occur in the park. Uh, so, for instance, uh, there is no organized sport activity or recreational activity. It's meant to be, other than in those, those stakeholder arrangements, it's meant to be a passive recreation sort of urban park. Um, and, uh, and that was uh, uh, finished by December 2017. I, I brought along a, a copies. I didn't know how many people would be at this, but I only have a couple of each one. But I want to uh, sort of highlight a couple things that might be of interest. Uh, so this is the... Uh, this is the policy committee report. You can see it's, it's not insubstantial. Um, and then I just took uh, a summary of the governance section of the master planning uh, <coughs> report. And, and his, when I was looking at this over the weekend, in anticipation of this, I thought this would be of interest to you. So in the, in the master planning process, that's that Exhibit B document, um, there is a <clears throat> recommendation at the end that uh, <clears throat> that the Blue Ribbon Committee recommends the city manager and the city council evaluate the need for a committee with a citywide perspective on policies related to parks and recreation. I don't know if you've seen this before today, but uh, um, the uh, discussions pertaining to city policies in Prescott Park are not unlike considerations needed in other parks and recreational assets of the city. As new and improved parks and recreational assets come online, uh, Prescott Park to be managed by the city manager, Sagamore Creek Recreational Area, Rockingham Branch Rail Trail, and the North Mill Pond multi-use path, et cetera. Now may be the time to rethink the structures and policies related to parks and recreation. So somebody was thinking about this a few years ago. What, and what year was that? The, so that, that was uh, it, it 17? Was January of 2017. It was adopted. So um, in, that, in that master planning process, uh, the city was assisted by Weston Sampson, uh, and it was fairly comprehensive. We didn't, uh, uh, and I sat on that uh, committee as well. Uh, we didn't go further into it because we thought that was beyond the scope of the master plan, but uh, there, there was a sense <clears throat> based on uh, comments and discussion that uh, comments from the public and discussion that occurred uh, back in 2016 that maybe there should be some greater policy committee. Um, and then in, in the uh, planning, uh, in the uh, policy uh, committee, the same type of thing. Uh, and this is on page 21 of that policy. It, it's very similar language that adopted on the master plan. So the, the, uh, the thought was that at that time, uh, um, this was probably too big a subject to, to uh, take up as part of the uh, Prescott Park planning and policy making. Um, but it, it, it may be appropriate to, or it, I think the committee thought it was appropriate to have a, a sort of a master plan and an oversight committee. Uh, what that committee looked like, we never got to that level. But I, just thinking it through, the the uh, uh, it, it seems like you have several different functions that are being discussed as part of this process. Uh, some is sort of the activity function, which the recreational board is doing very well with. The, uh, and the activities they're doing, and it sounds like the the uh, getting an overview of what the city has for assets in this area is currently under the auspices of the uh, Conservation Commission. Um, and and you know Prescott Park has had the benefit of extensive study in the last five years. Uh, I don't. I haven't seen the report that will come out, obviously, from the Recreation Commission, or I am. I haven't seen what the Conservation Commission has done, but uh, uh, it sounds like they may be the, you, you may be covering those functions. And so one issue you, I think you have is whether there really is a one-size-fits-all uh, committee that can, you know, be both an advocate and uh, sort of a, um, a uh, what I want to call it, uh, an acquisition-oriented uh, uh, group. 
uh, and and uh, and then devise policies at the same time. But I, I, I think just the sense of the planning <coughs> that uh, was done for Prescott Park, the thought was that it could be a committee whose job it really is is probably less oversight of activities such as the recreation, uh, but something that would uh, uh, look at and and create a comprehensive approach to uh, overseeing uh, policy-wise all the parks <coughs> in the city. <coughs> uh, and I and I will add that the the committee that I'm here sort of as a representative. Uh, is designed to uh, sunset as soon as the park is uh, master plan is built out, uh, which I suspect will be a few more years from today. <laughs> but uh, um, and and so far as uh, um, my understanding and my observation of the process, while it has occurred under the offices of the city manager, is that the the governor's model is working well. Um, I think I think having that uh, policy statement that was created in in December of 2000, it was finished in December of 2017, has given the city manager enough direction to be able to to uh, implement those policies uh, without having to reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, it's been time for a renewal of one of the license agreements, or somebody asked to do something in the park. Thank you. Appreciate that. Does anyone else want to share? Does your master plan take into consideration the effects of climate change and what impacts? As a matter of fact, it does. <clears throat> um, without getting too deep in the weeds, uh, the master plan, the original master plan, uh, <clears throat> envisioned that there would be some some need for. Uh, 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 adjustment to uh, environmental changes, climate changes, principally in things such as the height of the seawall. And then after the plan was adopted in the city with its consultants, uh, started doing the engineering and environmental studies and realized that the environmental issue was much greater than anticipated in the 2016. So in 2020, uh, we, uh, this committee that I'm on, uh, working again with the consultants, came back with a recommendation to uh, adjust the master plan specifically to deal with the environmental changes. It includes moving buildings, raising the level of certain areas of the park, uh, putting in uh, new uh, subsurface drainage, that type of thing. Okay. Thank you. Would you like to share with us? Well, just on the Trees and Greenery Committee, um, I guess the, there's about a long paragraph that says what we do, but basically advocate, we advocate for trees and greenery on, in public spaces uh, in Portsmouth, and um, there are nine or so of us, and, and um, we do the work, um, it was started by Evelyn Sorrell, I noticed that display back there when she appointed the committee 20 or so years ago and uh, there are three em city employees on the committee and six non-city employees and and we basically do what Evelyn what um, Clotilde Strauss did by herself for 20 years um, um, on a volunteer basis and um, in a uh, one part of the bureaucracy was um, <coughs> if not particularly friendly, uh, uh, probably hostile to her efforts to um, add greenery to the city. And um, we, um, we review all tree removals and some, and quite a bit of the planting in the city. So it's a very narrow focus, much narrower, I think, than most everybody else here. At the board. And Michael's on the board. Narrow, but very, very important. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so that we still have trees in the city and greenery um, throughout the city. So, and that's why we invited you here to be part of this discussion because what trees and public greenery does impacts all of our open spaces um, and even places that aren't necessarily open spaces. 
Peter, can you update so. them on the 400 trees? The um, and that's the the we are the 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 400 committee and the city and public works and the entire city um, and conservation involved in attempting to plant. A planning to plant, not attempting, but I'm going to be planting 400 trees for the 400th. The city is going to do its 100 trees, which it does about 100 trees a year, has been doing that for the last several years. For years it was much lower figure, but uh, we've had been blessed with incredible arborists in recent years. And um, uh, so the city will plant an extra 100 with the assistance of rotary funds, and then there are going to be 200 trees available for the public. And if you go onto the city's website, you can see the directions on how to get in line for that if you're interested in obtaining a tree to plant on your own property. Um, by you would do it, the city wouldn't do it, but they have a lot of instructions on how to do that. That's wonderful. Thank you. We appreciate it. Does, does anyone have any questions forward? Since you're here, do you want to share anything about cemeteries? <clears throat> I'm honored to be on the cemetery committee. Uh, we have a very vibrant group of people, a dynamic individual in particular. Our, I think she's co-chair. And uh, <clears throat> she's been able to locate and identify 39 cemeteries in the city of Portsmouth. They're all categorized, identified, located. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, she just found another one yesterday. <laughs> on on Banfield Road, um, the Croto family who live on that property that abuts St. Pat's Academy, that little cemetery, which is a private cemetery, is, is on the property of the new academy. So she she she's out there all looking everywhere. For, I think there are nine cemeteries that are property and belong to the city of Portsmouth for maintenance purposes. And we've identified and focused on right now at this point through the committee's effort and volunteers in the community to clean and wash all the monuments and grave markers. We've done the points of grave down on Pleasant Street, Mechanic, Mechanic Street. A large portion of the North Cemetery, we're going to continue working in there with shoreline protection which I, th I think that funding is now in place. Yeah, shoreline protection on the back side of that property. We've identified, and it, it showed up on that master plan of global impact, that that whole back banking that faces the North Mill Pond could over time completely erode and, and be subjected to soil erosion. So. Yeah, that, that's a, it's a wonderful committee, and the, the citizens have responded very well, and there's a lot of people working on that committee. One of the efforts that's taking place is to identify all the graves, location, and those people who are interred in those graves. And I think when that process is done, it'll be available at the library. Yeah, and I think through <clears throat> a portal on the website, so, as well. Yeah. So now when people come knocking on my mother's door, we're going to send them to <laughs> log on the computer and you can find who you're looking for and where they're located. So yeah, that, that, that committee's been uh, very energetic, energetic. And we're going to work with one of the naval crews of a submarine currently at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard for overhaul and maintenance, the Cheyenne. I believe it's the Cheyenne. It's a nuclear attack sub. Their crew, as part of their civic responsibilities, are, are going to work directly with us to clean the headstones in the Cotton Cemetery, which is off South Street. Hmm. So that's newsworthy. They have, you know, 30, 40 sailors up there scrubbing and cleaning stones. So that's planned for this summer. Oh. Thank you so much yeah, for that update. It's a, it's a good committee. And I just add <coughs> in, I, there has been some conversation in the cemetery committee about the fact that people do use um, the cemetery areas to walk their dogs, to basically have that green space. Um, it's definitely serving a green space component in the city. Um, as someone who frequently <laughs> hangs out in cemeteries because of the green space and the quiet. Um, and it does serve also some connectivity 
um, depending on which cemetery we're talking about. So it does, in some ways, fit in with some of the other conversation here because it becomes a, a link and a resource <clears throat> for those passive recreation, just sitting outside in the quiet. If I were only to estimate during the peak of the shutdown of the pandemic, that on a daily basis, 2,000 people, families and children would be in the South Cemetery just as a means of walking and exercise and, mm -hmm. and to get down onto Little Harbor Road. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was a, happy to host them. Uh, thank you for saying that because that's my route to Little Harbor Road <laughs> when I go out walking. So, um, so yes, I think that you know sometimes we forget that our cemeteries are also open spaces within the city and people do use them for recreation purposes um, and just for actually uh, also passive recreation sitting and um, having a nice quiet space to sit so um, so well, I've undertaken in that South Cemetery which is comprised by five separate cemeteries all adjoining each other so the term South Cemetery includes proprietors Harmony Grove Elmwood Cemetery Cotton Cemetery and Sagamore Cemetery and I've planted over 50 trees in the last eight years, and I continue to plan to do so, put more in there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, and so cemeteries should be also part of any master planning process, and we should be thinking about that because, you know, at what point do we need more cemetery, <coughs> cemetery resources in the city? Um, that's always a, another question. It's, it's more like when do we need new parks? When do we need new cemeteries? You know, um, it's not as if we're not all eventually going there. <laughs> so, so we have to think long term, um, I think, in the planning process around that as well. So thank you for highlighting that for us, too. Um, Can I make a request? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm on MapGeo, and I just tried to enter cemeteries in Portsmouth, and it, it, you can't filter that way. So it would be a good thing to add. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Yes, Councilor Lombardi, or Councilor Tabor. <laughs> Calling, just talking to the Council <laughs> Lombardi, <laughs> Councilor Tabor. Um, a, a larger question in a minute, but do we have any uh, key to all of the historic grave sites? Um, mm. Is there any way somebody can walk through and see Levi Woodbury? Yes, and, Susan, I guess. And <laughs> my cousin Dick Adams, and, who's probably one of our greatest historical resources in Portsmouth and a member of the Athenaeum. He does walkthroughs at the South Cemetery twice a year to highlight all the historical significance and people that are there. I know Sue Polidoro does the North Cemetery on a frequent basis, but to your point, um, we're hoping to erect a sign <coughs> similar to the one at the North Cemetery at the entrance of the South Cemetery, identifying, you know, Frank Jones and Woodbury and yeah. and all the notable people that are in there. And then down on Maplewood, we've got signers of the Constitution and uh, yeah, Langdon's there yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. Whipple. Mm -hmm. So, um, my larger question was. Uh, <coughs> This has been great because we've seen there's advocacy for adding green space through the Conservation Commission. There's a foreshadowing from the, the 2017 work on Prescott Park <coughs> of some policy body for parks. Um, I'll just put this out as a straw man. What if there were an expansion of the Recreation Committee to Parks and Recreation, and that body would look at not just the inventory but the programming for all the parks. Um, Prescott Park is, is it such a unique case, I don't know that it can fall under a committee for the whole city, um, but uh, I'm just putting that out as an idea because in looking at other towns and cities, that's very common. Right. Um, and we didn't know if there were great benefits from it or no benefits at all. You know, maybe what we're doing right now um, is fine. But I, 
in terms of program, you know, we've got areas like Jones Avenue where there's a lot of land and um, some trails, but you know, what could could that be? Um, we've got neighborhood parks in Maple Haven and Panway and McEachern Park. Um, and I was at National Night Out, and for National Night Out, the, all those parks were filled with people doing things, kids having, um, you know, tug of war and, and games of various types. Um, and it just occurred to me that um, <clears throat> there's an opportunity for more program for all the, the parkland that we have, but how would we do it? Um, and then, uh, you know, there's there's hidden gems like the water access on Sagamore Avenue, the little dock behind Seacoast Mental Health, um, and people don't know about that. But mm -hmm. it's got a rope swing. It's got it's it's just great. It's so. a lot of use. You'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're probably right. Yeah. <clears throat> so I would just put that out there as a pro or con, just... Mm -hmm. I, would, I would agree on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good... You know, they, they, do, they do go hand in hand in the parks and the recreation. And this is something I thought about even two years ago, is to, you know, bring, bring all that in and expand what we have uh, uh, for assets and recreation and <clears throat> look at all the small areas that we have, whether it be the boat ramp on the Sagamore. We haven't even got into the Sagamore Creek area, you know, I, you know, it used to be called the, the old Jones Avenue property, but, you know, I've walked all through there, there's all sorts of nice trails you can have up there. You could have mountain biking, you, you could get have mountain biking, you know, frisbee, whatever, golf frisbee, yeah. uh, you know, all those things you can have up there, and it's just unused, it's untapped right, right now, and uh, we have the Banfield Road access uh, to uh, the rail trail, you know, we bought that purchased that property <coughs> where the house was at the end of uh, Constitution, and uh, that's a great spot, another spot uh, for, you know, expanding for parking maybe to get in there so people could pull in and just start walking. Right. You know, all, those, all those areas that we have. Uh, Route 33, you know, the lay down area. Yeah. Uh, eventually it's, it's a great skate bog. park in the corner. Yeah, yeah. The great bog. So there's a lot of things we could uh, look into to expand our, you know, uh, availability and spectrum of what we have for all sorts of passive recreation, regular recreation. Yeah. And active, yeah. Active, yeah. So what would you see as the Conservation Commission role with that? Because it has sort of been with the Conservation Commission other than the more active recreation. <coughs> Um, has been their focus on the more passive recreation and, um, it, but also assessing the balance between the natural resources and the passive recreation because there are certain things, especially with so many invasive species that we need to be really careful of and including permitting and things like that, water quality, drinking water quality, stormwater, all those things. Some of these properties really have a lot of value that way. Um, and so right. there's there's sort of a balance of how you would do that, that right. how how would that happen, kind of. I, I might suggest that you know once, you know an idea is created, a, a site is suggested, that it go through you know due diligence with conservation committee, seeing if that is viable, if it's something we could do, uh, you know uh, taking into consideration all the things you just mentioned. And, uh, and then what, what type of uh, popularity would have, what type of utilization would we get out of it? Um, so it would be you know, some way that the Recreation Board would communicate with conservation, you know, when there's an idea up there, or vice versa. You know, conservation might say, hey, you know, here's a good spot, you know, mm -hmm. this is really good. And then suggest it to the Recreation and say, how could we go ahead and maximize this opportunity in front of us? Mm -hmm. um, the same thing with, uh, you know, we, we do have liaison. We have a school board liaison. We have a city council liaison on the board. 
you know, so that's good to have. So we have those good input uh, for that, and uh, and then we got DP, you know, DPW access mm -hmm. right, you know, right away. Um, so maybe that's something that we can, you know, collectively agree on before somebody, you know, you know makes a final decision. Right, and mm -hmm. I guess too much ownership too, because. <clears throat> The Conservation Commission has done so much on the inventory and the recommendations, you know, where they've looked at a property and said, okay, this one's really good for a wildlife corridor. We could put some trails right. in here. So there's a lot of specifics that, you know, we would want you to, whoever starts to look at it, but also to avoid getting people, the Conservation Commission, on the defensive right. a little bit, you know, to yeah. kind of be part of well, the that's process that's very part of early you know, it's on. Well, that's all part of it. say it's something gets identified. You do your due diligence and say, "Is this, you know, yeah. is this something that's viable?" Yeah, you look and you, yeah, you look mm -hmm. at the documents. Put it to, you know, put it to, put it to the conservation board, you know, because boards change over, things change, you know. Yeah. Uh, we want to keep a consistency going, um, and have you, you know, look at it and say, "Yeah, this is this something we can do." Yeah. And with your recommendation, we proceed. Mm -hmm. You know, just like if it was a fire situation. You know, we don't want to have uh, with fire department. We need to have them take a look at something, um, or for a building or some sort of access. Uh, you know, the same process we should probably have. Yeah, lots of communication. Yes. Oh. And and that's why you know I brought you all here together because I feel like there's a role for all of you in this planning piece, and in order to plan in advance of the master plan piece, it might be worthwhile. To have some joint meetings, um, and because it's it's not just, uh, for example, like we this might be a good place to put trails. Uh, that involves trees usually, right. and removing trees. <laughs> it's really important to have the discussion around, you know, do we want to remove trees in this location to put in a trail? Is this a location that the conservation commission has decided is a location that makes sense for? Uh, for development into um, the more uh, more active recreation opportunity, and and so since the conservation commission is making those looking at the open space plan, um, and and making that those kind of bigger calls on you know what can we develop, what can we not develop, um, I think it's important that we make sure all of you are having those conversations um, so that we can more effectively plan, I think, in the, the long run. Um, because it's it's great to have an, an open space plan, but if if no one is is saying, oh well this is, you know, this is what we need, where can we like say we need a new kayak, uh, space to put in kayaks. If no one's saying, well this is a space that we actually think would be most viable and most reasonable and wouldn't impact um, property that we don't want to develop, um, then it's a lot easier to, to kind of execute on that plan rather than kind of, you know, hoping we can find a space, I think, is the, and I, I'm, ho I'm wanting to make sure that we are doing that bigger planning piece um, before we develop a master plan that then doesn't have any of those kind of long-term that long-term thinking in it. I think, you know, we're fortunate because the staff does a great job of this in coordinating on the staff side, um, but sometimes you know having some having some public meetings where you can have some residents come forward from neighborhoods that maybe don't have uh, resources and want them, um, it you know it would be helpful to have that kind of open forum discussion around the bigger plan of of open space and parks, so that individuals can say you know our neighborhood doesn't really have a space where the kids can go play or or where um, adults feel like they can go and just sit or um, you know we have a lot of bird watchers in the neighborhood and um, we're sneaking through private property to get to this other property that has great bird watching you know it's it's that kind of um, making sure that we have that kind of public input I think is really critical as well so um, or here's another for instance, you know, there was a plan to take Worth Lot and Bridge Street Lot and turn those into parks, underground the parking, and have live entertainment there. Um, that was all, um, I think Weston and Sampson 
did some preliminary sketching for that, and but who would advocate for it? You know, it, it didn't have a. That, that's all kind of died out. Um, but maybe it's still a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, so parks are not just green space outside the downtown. Parks are in the heart of downtown, mm -hmm. or could be. Yes, Council. I would just add there's um, most urban environments have plazas as well, and um, they, they are uh, an important piece of it. It might not be green, um, but it still might be a very useful public space. Thank you for pointing that out. That is important. So what's interesting is I, I'm i aware of the work that the Conservation Commission has done, the, the PULAs and, and the great uh, um, sort of efforts that they have made over the years to kind of look at connectivity and the wild spaces, the, the limiteds that we have and, and, and future acquisitions and, you know, familiar with all the recommendations, you know, oh, Jones Avenue. I mean, I've been here over 20 years. And I think um, the challenge that we have, um, I think in, in part, is not that we don't have a lot of good ideas, but a lot of these good ideas cost money. Mm -hmm. And I think that, just kind of tuck that in the back of your head, because when you're looking at, you know, it's really how do you prioritize <clears throat> the money you have? Because every time you want to add a program for rec, that's a body or some part of a body. Um, or if we're going to acquire property, it means not only do we purchase the property like community campus, but then we have all of the maintenance and requirements related to that. And as um, Barbara so uh, adeptly pointed out that even when there's no facility on that property, we still have certain obligations depending on how we took that property and conservation easements to make sure there's no dumping on that property. Etc. So I think just tuck that in the back of your head because there has been a lot of good planning that's gone on. But as we see with the cemetery committee, and I think why it's been so active, and um, is because there wasn't an advocate for a while, and in the priority list that went down. I think we've actually been better at the acquiring property, whether it's been the Sagamore Headlands, the doing the boat ramps, um, the rail, you know, trying to work on the rail trail. Um, so just, like I said, don't lose sight of that because I don't think there's anything you've said here that is new to me. It's a question of um, resources, both in terms of, of staff or, you know, money to acquire or facilities to construct. You just have to tuck that in and it's a prior all priorities. You know, where do you want to spend your money? And knowing that we're going to be spending, well, what's the current estimate for phase one in Prescott Park? Eight million? Are we up to? A lot. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think that's a good point. I think climate change is going to have to maybe be part of the, definitely will have to be part of the analysis when we look at next steps for acquiring properties and, and recreational uses, both passive and other and it's going to have habitat issues obviously mm -hmm. so yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's a really it's a really important point um, and and that might be why it's worthwhile having an overarching plan that you know then we can plan you know what time frames we execute different pieces of this plan and and you know develop DPW has a fantastic maintenance schedule already but then that allows also DPW as we have a, a plan for developing <coughs> to, to figure out you know, what point can we take on maintenance on a new facility or a new, even if it's just a kayak access point that you have to keep mowed, <laughs> right? yeah. that kind of thing, or create a path. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So if we have the bigger plan, then it's much easier to, um, for everyone, down the road, even if it takes 20 years, 30 years, 40 years to get there to realize the plan, it's it's nice to know kind of what's next. 
Um, I think the other piece to factor in is, and I've mentioned this to the committee, but just so you know, you know sometimes the city uh, staff will uh, get inquiries, you know, about, oh, I'm interested in perhaps selling my undeveloped property. And those do usually go through a kind of vetting internally to see how they may match up. I have to say Peter Britz, I think, has done a good job over the years being on the alert for parcels that... Uh, may become available um, we might have an interested property owner to determine well maybe this goes to conservation commission to see if this is one we should look at acquiring um, that you know as you know it's a challenge for a municipality to buy property sometimes because <laughs> we have very specific interests and needs and that sometimes doesn't always give you the best price for that. We have to do it all in public. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So that's one of the other challenges we have. But just so I think everyone is aware that staff is on the lookout for those opportunities and bringing them forward to either the city council or the relevant land use boards um, when it looks like there might be some advantage to entering into negotiations with property owners. Um, yeah, and I think when that comes up, this this conversation is helpful because, I mean, you know, just even thinking about the recreation part of it more, if, if we're the ones looking at it because it has more sense to go to the Conservation Commission because it's got a lot of value that way. Um, but at the same time, thinking about all the other uses, why we're talking about it, I think. Right, yeah, it's just the idea would generate probably from, you know, the recreation saying, hey, we ought to do frisbee golf or whatever you know right. and then uh you know and then have you look at it and say is that a viable is that a viable option to do right. on this particular piece of or, land or come and say where do you think that would be a good right option which right. we almost have enough information to make that recommendation right exactly i know because you have a lot of good information on the bog yeah. and all that other yeah, jazz yeah you have an interest yeah it's good to talk about it absolutely so with that um Thank you. Um, if, Chairman, Chairman, thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, just a final thought listening to this conversation. You know, one of the values of this larger policy committee is that you'd have everybody in the room who was balancing those competing interests of getting, you know, land that we want to just keep natural versus land that we want to add additional recreational facilities, et cetera. And to Suzanne's point, that if you have that committee and it's making recommendations to the city as part of either the you know capital improvement plan or otherwise, it's already filtered those balancing interest in when it makes a recommendation, and it's already had the benefit of a lot of public input. You know, the the this committee that I currently chair, the Master Plan Implementation Committee for Prescott Park, it it's really just has two functions. One is to make recommendations to the city manager of the process as it's, it's sort of an extra level of, of eyes looking at it, uh, an assistant city manager, on implementing the plan, but also it allows for public input. So instead of the, you know, the DPW and the and the uh, um, and the city manager and the consultants kind of working and trying to adjust to things like engineering studies. And now, he, every time there's <clears throat> something, a change or a development, it it, ha it goes to a committee where there's a public hearing and people can make their input, and then we can pass that through as well. So, it, it there's a value to having that process to reach a better result. Um, I, I, if nothing else, I, even if it took a while to figure out this, what this thing might look like, uh, I, I almost think having a, a, a joint hearing with several of these committees once a year where people come in and express their, uh, their thoughts and requests and thing would be a, uh, helpful for citizens, you know, and particularly if they're here to talk about not wanting to have a new athletic program or a new uh, passive recreational thing and there's somebody from conservation commission who say well just understand that you want to do that over near a very sensitive environmental area like the like the great bog um, it it gives the 
the public a better perspective of how their choices are impacting right. others. Thank you. Um, and I guess then I, w I would like to close our discussion by asking, are you all interested in maybe having continued discussions together? Um, you know, if we um, talk with, um, uh, find ways to get you together, together um, to continue kind of this discussion and figure out kind of a, a process for, um, or even further recommendations back to the governance committee on what we should consider. Um, does that seem reasonable? Yes. Because, yeah. you know, governance committee, we're really not the experts <laughs> on parks, clearly. At least I speak for myself. Definitely I'm not an expert on parks or open space planning. And everyone here really is thinking about that in ways that um, I am not on an everyday basis. So um, I really would prefer that you guys decide what makes sense um, in, in this in this forum and then let us know what you think makes sense. Uh, I think it would be much more valuable for us. I'd like to be kept in the loop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, okay. I, I don't know whether my committee is so unique in this process that we add value to what you're talking about because to say no. we're we are completely planned out, so to speak, um, and, and Presco Park is a unique, uh, uniquely situated in the downtown area, and, and has a unique set of programming that that uh, I, I'm I'm just not sure how we whether we're a round peg in a square hole. Mm. I would comment on that, and that what you have is the experience of creating. A plan like that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I think that's valuable. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm happy to help out. I just, yeah. Yeah. I feel like I would be a, a stump on a log or something just <laughs> watching the <laughs> conversation around me. But mm -hmm. uh, it's it's that it's that planning that bigger planning function. I think that is it's really helpful of. Um, because when we talk about a park space, we don't always we don't talk just about the field. You know, we're also thinking right. about um, the bigger plan for that space. And um, and when we talk about putting in a new field somewhere, we need to know where the best place in the city is to put the field, <laughs> what makes the most sense. Um, and, and so I think there's there's kind of this bigger discussion that, that should probably be taking place um, uh, because we want to make sure that we're really deliberate. And, and I just had a question about city staff's role in this because I do feel like city staff has been handling a lot of this and knows the background and and I totally get the public process and everybody doing that but what you know that would be something to contemplate on how much of a role yeah and and that's why we spoke with the city staff first and you know it's interesting because they all take they all are responsible for different areas of of what are currently our parks and open spaces um, and, but we didn't have a clear consensus from the city staff on what the recommendation should be, you know, who should handle this this bigger function. Um, and that's why we brought you all here, um, just to see if you had kind of different insights from the perspective of citizens serving um, on on your boards or commissions or committees. And, um, and so the city staff would definitely be involved um, in any further discussions as well. So we wouldn't, uh, we definitely wouldn't be excluding them. We want their valuable insights. Um, we we can't do planning unless we know what maintenance looks like for a DPW. And, and right now they do the bulk of all of that maintenance um, in most of our parks. We have some unique situations, but beyond that, yeah, so. Okay. All right. Thank can, you. Can I just ask, offer, Barbara, if you had some materials that you wanted to share with the oh, committee, I'm yeah. happy to send so, those afterwards. Okay. So everything's yeah. on a thumb drive that's actually in your laptop okay. right now. But I, I have to steal it back. Uh, I yeah. Do. You can steal it yeah. back. And then, and then just send it to me. Or type links to the document. That's what I expected. Okay. And, but that might be good for them to know because I know what the pool is and okay. things like yeah. that. So. Yeah, I was thinking I think definitely recommend everybody taking a look at it. Yep. 
Um, thank you all just for coming today and sharing your insights. We really appreciate it. Um, I wouldn't ask you to sit through, definitely not ask you to sit through the rest of our <laughs> meeting today. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Right. Um, okay. So the next item on our agenda is an update. Um, I just was going to give a little verbal update on where we are with administrative ordinance status. That's something that we had been talking about, changing the um, some changes to the administrative ordinance. I'm still working with the legal department on what is feasible legally and what's not feasible. So um, we're still kind of doing research. I didn't want anyone to, to think that that was just out there. Um, we're still doing kind of the background work. So I will bring it back when we're, when, when I have some idea from the legal department. Yes. Would you That's mind if we had a short break? No. Um, let's break for three, four minutes yeah. and come back. Maybe okay. I'm the only one. But no, it's fine. That's all right. Let's break. Let's, let's come back at 11.15. Okay.
I was going to here. I'm going to stop sharing for just a second because I want to share with you um, an update that I've been preparing on committee structure because this is something that we have been talking about um, here, and I want to make sure uh, everybody um, sees kind of like what we've been discussing for a while. Um, so bear with me just for a second. I'm sharing my screen first, and. I'm going to do a slideshow, um, if I can get it, slideshow. So um, so I, I just started working on a basic PowerPoint just to show, to outline kind of our current committee board commission structure, um, because I think it's, it's very confusing uh, for most people. Um, it was even confusing for me when I started first looking at it. Um, so, uh, and it can be very confusing because we have so many different categories. Uh, so what I did first is I tried to outline where the city council's role was um, and in relation to our different types of committees. Uh, we have quasi-judicial boards and commissions, and I note here that it's important to realize that while they're appointed by the city council, they don't necessarily report directly to the city council. They make their own independent decisions, um, and they only report back to the city council when the city council requests a report back on something. Um, but their decisions but can be appealed to the city council. Some of their decisions, not not the planning board and zoning board, and those those decisions are appealed to a superior court. So um, so they don't necessarily report directly to the council, um, and so that's why they're here to the side. Um, but then we have standing committees, uh, we have council committees or subcommittees of the council, and we also have blue ribbon committees. So we kind of have three different types of committees operating right now. Um, and then, in addition to that, the city manager also um, oversees regulatory and technical committees. Um, and then we have additional elected boards that, while they don't report to the city manager, they report through the city manager to the council. Um, so think about the, the police department, the fire department, the school department, um, they have their own governing structure, but the city council then report, or gets, receives reports through the city manager for those entities. Okay. Um, there's also some, there's an, also another category here, uh, library trustees as well, but um, their governance structure is just slightly different because they don't have an elected board. Um, and so when you put these things together <laughs> and you're looking at this structure, I think it can be very confusing to a lot of people. Uh, it's not all committees report in the same manner. Um, and, and so when you look at the listing of committees um, online, someone will say, well, I didn't know we had a, a building committee, you know. <laughs> well, that's because it's not a committee of the council, it's a regulatory technical committee that reports through the city manager, or the committee reports to the planning board. So we have a few of those as well. Um, so our elected boards and commissions, everybody's aware of these besides the city council. Um, but then we also have, you know, quasi judicial boards and commissions. Um, the trustees of the trust fund also has some of that authority as well to act. Um, as we heard earlier, they used to manage the Prescott Park Trust in the planning around the Prescott Park. Um, and then we also have council subcommittees. I have the Veterans Committee here because it's the one that is a question mark for me still. Um, I've been working on this for a year, not really clear on, on where it fits in this structure. But really, that's the Fees Schedule Study Committee, Governance Committee, Land Use Committee, Legislative Subcommittee. And the Land Use Committee is, is unusual because it includes non-council members, but it's really a, a committee of the council. Um, and Veterans Committee, I think, was designed in the same way, not as a Blue Ribbon Committee. Um, but I, I, again, I'm not terribly clear. Um, and then we have standing committees, um, 
everybody knows these committees. These are committees that are established by ordinance. Um, you'll see the trustees of trust funds is here as well. Um, they kind of have a dual role there. Um, and then you have your blue ribbon committees. We have a significant number of blue ribbon committees. Um, I have a question around blue ribbon committees and um, if we should somehow create just an ordinance enabling us to have blue ribbon committees and providing some definition around what they are um, because I think a lot of people don't know what they are they just they're on the website there's no real clear understanding of how they operate when they operate how appointments work um, this is for the general public so that people understand what these are um, but again these are not established by ordinance and the majority of them are just established by votes of the City Council Mm -hmm. And if I can just weigh in, these are typically established, that's why it says mayor. So they're mm -hmm. the mayor's special committees, and they are typically at the beginning of each mayoral, new mayoral cycle, so every two years, um, there's an affirmative vote to reestablish or not the various blue ribbon committees. Yes. Um, the, the interesting challenge that we have is we have several of these that have been operating for a very long period of time and who have members that aren't reappointed um, so so that's something that we should also look at potentially as a committee is you know what what really are the guidelines for a mayor's blue ribbon committee um, if if the case is that you know these are really the mayor's committees and they're set up every um, with every new mayor's term then the council in that term should have a recommendation to reestablish you know the ones the mayor would like to reestablish and to vote on everyone who's sitting on those committees to be reappointed um, yes it seems to me that there are some of these that probably should be taken out of that group um, I'm looking at a citywide neighborhood for mm -hmm. example seems like that's something that could and does continue through different councils Mm -hmm. um, I think the um, perhaps sustainable practices, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, mean, I think we have to look at that for several of these. Yes, yes, and, and that is the challenge. Is we have several here that that have existed for a long time. The African Burying Ground Stewardship Blue Ribbon Committee is another one that that is likely to be around for a very long time. Um, so uh, the Portsmouth Energy Advisory Committee made, uh, you know, who knows what the end result is there, but it probably may tra transition to a, a different status as well. So, um, so this is something that we should look at as a committee, and if we have recommendations to make some more permanent, we should probably make those recommendations and move forward with ordinance to do so. Um, but we probably should have those conversations with those committees as well. Um, and then we have regulatory technical committees. These are the ones that I was highlighting. Uh, people don't know all of these actually exist and meet, um, but they report um, on technical aspects of what we are doing or deal with technical aspects of what the city's doing. And then um, we also have the committees that are outside the council authority. So the board, board of library trustees, um, they make their own decisions about the library, um, but they're appointed by the council, um, and but they actually report through the city manager um, because their budget comes through the the city. Then there's the housing authority board, which is appointed by the council via the mayor, but we they actually have their own outside budget and their own governing structure so they don't report through the city manager in the same way um, and then we have representatives of the council that are appointed to outside boards where we have no authority over any of their decision making we have representatives there well in the case of Rockingham planning I think the councillor is a voting member of the Commission yes yes so as is somebody from the planning board yeah so that's but 
the good the thing is the council doesn't control what happens there. I think that's the distinction I was trying to make, and I think you're right, Councillor Tabor. Um, we have representatives who have voting authority or um, get to share views of the council, but the council doesn't have authority over the entity. So, um, and do we uh, have a representative to coast? I, don't, I didn't. We, I didn't know that. <laughs> we do have a representative to Coast. Um, currently, our representative to Coast, I believe, is Eric Evie. Yeah, I think it is Eric. Eric. Evie. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's a staff. It's not a council. We staff. have a staff representative, but um, that is up to the purview of the, the council. That can change. Um, that is, uh, the mayor could appoint somebody there. So, um, so. We have different roles that govern committee operations. The elected boards and commissions are governed by the charter. Our quasi-judicial boards are governed by state law, city charter, and city ordinance. Council subcommittees are just governed by council motions. Uh, standing committees are governed by ordinance, city ordinance. Um, the mayor's blue ribbon committees are, again, governed by just council motion. Uh, the regular t regulatory and technical committees are much more complicated. Um, federal law, state law, um, city charter, city ordinance, some of them have, follow quasi-judicial committee rules. So those are really specific to what they do, uh, and, and they're serving as a very specific purpose. And then the others are gather, governed, again, by state law, charters, rules, bylaws, their own, um, not ours. So. Um, so that's it. Um, I just thought it would be helpful to give you all an overview of what I've been trying to create this chart to help explain to people how our committees work so that we can start making those distinctions between committees for our residents so I think it's a little less confusing. Um, in the long run for, for people trying to determine, do I want to serve on a committee? How, you know, what is this, how does this committee work? What are the rules for this committee? Because if you join, especially a mayor's blue ribbon committee, um, you, and you come to your first meeting, a lot of times there are no specific set rules for that committee. Um, and and uh, you don't know exactly what the operations should be or are. So, um, so. We also left out the 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 P's board has a Portsmouth appointed representative. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, P's does, and so uh, you know, and that's another that's an example of one of those outside outside entities where we appoint. So, um, so just this was just supposed to be informational today to help help share kind of where i am and trying to to create some understanding um of, around committees and committee structure and i will keep working on that with the city until we have answers on all of them and then um maybe talk to uh our city clerk about ways that that we can make sure uh we provide education to people who are interested in committees uh, around what the committee's functions are and, and the structure. And then, and this gives us kind of some idea of maybe things we need to address too uh, around mayor's blue ribbon committees. Um, and with that said, um, I'm gonna move on to new business. Um, today, I brought forward a motion, a draft motion, just for discussion uh, based upon our last committee meeting around fee study. Um, if you'll remember at our last governance committee meeting, uh, we briefly discussed that maybe fee study might need a third person so that we have uh, the, the ability there to vote um, and not have a one-to-one -one vote. And uh, so I drafted some language um, and uh, the language I drafted was uh, it's simple move to add a third city councilor to the fee study committee to allow for a decisive vote when there are differing viewpoints. And the history around this, um, our city clerk was very kind to bring the history. Um, the initial decision to establish the fee study committee was made in April of 1982. Um, and it was a mayor's suggestion that it might make sense to have three council members um, work on uh, with appropriate official, officials to review fee schedules. 
Um, specifically, uh, they were looking for fee schedules for with the fire department, the recreation department, outdoor pool, ambulance, and anything that might need to be changed and have recommendations come back to the council for the following June. Um, and it was seconded and voted. And um, then in May, they came up with a new fee schedule. Um, and uh, they, they essentially just uh, came back to the council, gave the fee schedule, and then the fee study committee just continued to operate from then on. So again, this is one of those committees that was established by a motion of the council um, and, and really is a subcommittee of the council or a council committee. Uh, so in order to alter it, um, all we have to do is pass a motion um, at the council level. And so that's why you have this draft language. Why did it go to two after it was appointed for as three? I have no idea. <laughs> and I don't think Patricia. any of us know. Well, and I, I mean, think so, so there was not a vote to reduce the size of the committee. It just so that is still there then if I, in well, the or, or origin of the committee it still says three. We have a tradition of appointing two at this stage. So it m might be helpful. It, just as a reminder to the council that you know, um, let's point, let's let's pass. Go ahead and pass a motion to make it three, if that's the recommendation of the committee. So, um, so I don't want to prejudge the recommendation of the committee. I put forward draft language just based upon our last discussion. Mm -hmm. So, so the origin of it was to create the table of fees mm -hmm. and have some place that some body that would review that so that those could be added into the budget without the budget processing having to go through every single one of the 150 fees. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder how it got from three to two. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's hard to, to, to track that information down. Um, the, the challenge is the city clerk would have to go through every single motion, and then you might not even find one. It might just be that that at some point a mayor didn't appoint a third person or somebody decided they didn't want to serve on the committee anymore. And so you might have even appointed three, but halfway through um, a term someone decided they didn't really want to serve on the committee and the mayor didn't appoint somebody to replace them. And then it became two. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as a practical matter because it's not in an ordinance and defined, this, this city council can by one vote of the body decide how many it would like to have on the fee committee. So say if you would like three, then you could have three. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. Well, you're on the committee, right, John? <laughs> I'm on the committee. Well, so what do you think <laughs> of that? Well, we've never, in all our years that I've been on it, three years, had anything referred to us. That was a first. Um, and our work has typically been to look at the, the schedule of fees one by one and make sure that they represent just covering the cost of the city and, and not much more. Um, so it was almost an administrative task. Um, but it was good to have counselors on there because they have a sense for, you know, pushing back if it looks like a fee is going up too much or, or maybe spotting one that is a growing area of cost in the budget that, you know, doesn't really cover the, the cost. But it was very narrow um, scope of duties. Um, you know, we could add, a, I think it would be good to add a third person just so there's no, um, the inability to pass a motion with one person for and one person who won't second is, is obviously a flaw. Um, I was just going to say, I concur. It's always been a fairly narrow um, mission, shall we say, of the fee committee, which is, I don't, I can't remember anything this has been 
Oh, maybe once before, but it's been a while since something was referred to the fee committee. It does tend to be a more of a housekeeping part of the budget process that we start here internally and have a city councilor sit on the fee committee precisely to kind of answer some of these questions and vet them. You know, does this make sense in mm -hmm. terms of a fee increase? So. So I guess what I would say is um, the choice or the decision, as far as I can see, is that um, you want a body that can vote, um, and um, but you also, the other side of that is um, that means you're encumbering a, the time of another counselor. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, I would, I would listen to John's recommendation on which way to go, <laughs> and I would second whatever he says. <laughs> I think it depends on the scope of work. You know, if if it continues to be the small, the narrowly defined scope of work, uh, you may not need a third counselor. But if we're going to be referred tricky questions like. Um, outdoor, dining. outdoor dining or stormwater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's, there may be merit to it. Um, All right, then I'll make the motion to add a third person. Is there a second? <laughs> I just, I just really hadn't thought about the, the how vital is the need. Um, so, uh, all right, you've proposed a motion. I'll second for. Did I help? <laughs> Do you want to get there? <laughs> I could shed some light on a couple of other things that are involved here, mm -hmm. but I can wait. Okay. It's up to the chair. Uh, I'll second for discussion. Okay. Second for discussion. And do you want to suspend the rules and um, have the offer of public comment on this motion? Uh, let's let's go ahead and suspend the rules and bring up public comment in general before we finish the discussion on this committee if somebody okay. would or so on this moved. issue yeah i'll second on that all in favor aye aye, aye. okay um is there public comment yeah <laughs> and and this is the public comment section in general so feel free so to i check. need to hit everything else that i wanted to hit <laughs> yeah. oh, no. Oh, yeah. no. oh no oh <laughs> no are you sure <laughs> I, it's okay okay peter hooter 280 south street uh i was on the fee committee with uh, Councillor Tabor and um, a little more enlightenment on why the fee committee is so important and it's so important for it to meet when it does is um, it is part of the budgeting process. Um, the fees add into the budget every year so it's one of those things that um, the staff needs the guidance of that committee yay or nay on what they bring forward to actually um, move that revenue big or small as it is, into the budget so they can account for that. So that's that's the other side of this. Um, as far as uh, uh, another counselor on there, I, I don't have a, an opinion either way. I think it's, a, it's an important committee based on its involvement in the budget. So um, that's something for you to consider when you're, when you're thinking about this mm -hmm. um, as to the importance of having two or three or whatever. I mean, it hasn't been that um, a big issue came up on this, but um, there, there are, staff goes through and actually reviews all of our fees um, yearly, and um, this is the main purpose. That's right. Okay. So that's, that's on that. Okay. So do you want me to keep going or not? Yeah, might as well do your thing. Okay, so the next thing, since it's fresh on my mind, um, Councillor Click, when you put up your flow chart, um, I noticed that you had the city manager outstanding by themselves. The city manager reports to the council. You missed a line. 
that's the only thing I noticed. There was no line going for the city councilor that I saw reporting directly to the council. And I think that's very important. The city, city manager is not standalone. Um, on uh, your other committees, um, it was great that you had everybody here, but I would agree with Tom um, being on the Prescott Park um, Master Plan Committee. Um, it seems, looking in from the outside, that you, the, the, all of the members here are looking for a process. Um, you'd like to bring in uh, anybody who would like to su suggest a, a park or anything else, um, and I think um, the Governance Committee is the perfect committee to um, establish this process and define what, what a resident would do, what, what if uh, a request came from conservation or rec. Um, I think what, what is needed here desperately is a process for them to say, oh, I know what I should do now, bam, bam, bam. So um, I think this committee is the perfect committee to do that. And I guess the other thing I would say on that, um, I would also agree with Tom that some, in, in the case of different requests on this, you probably won't even need one committee or another committee or another committee, and um, that should be decided by um, either governance or, or the council. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and seeing no one on Zoom, um, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment, and uh, we will resume our discussion of this fee study draft motion that is on the table. Um, any other thoughts on well, motion. maybe I'm just getting innately conservative in my late 60s, but um, I think the, the, it's been correctly stated that you need a couple of counselors to look at the fee schedule so that that is ready to roll into the budget. And, um, and that's the purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure we have to burden a third counselor with with participation. I think it's it's a, been a pretty clean process in my years on the, on the fee committee. So, um, aside from this one incident where we were referred a hot potato, mm -hmm. um, it's worked reasonably well. Um, okay. So I wouldn't be jumping to change it, but I wouldn't oppose it if the two of you, you know, I would feel fine if, if the two of you felt it was important to do. And I would respond to that. Um, I would agree with the majority of, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's, I mean, that's why I was trying to defer to you. <laughs> Uh, you know so anyway it's a challenge you know my my thoughts on this are um we may not need the third person on fee study <clears throat> but if something is referred to fee study that might may be a difficult decision and we do need a third person it's too late to add the third person so um, I wonder if you can, if it's possible not to necessarily add a third person, and this is a legal question, but add a, um, I guess the word's not alternate, but a, um, a standby member of the, <laughs> of the fee study committee for discussions beyond the standard. Do you see what I'm saying? I don't, so I don't. this is why we need three people in this room. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, you know, we, would, we don't want to end up in a situation where we don't have the third member. Uh, or maybe it's an education issue where we say to the council, we don't necessarily believe there's a need for a third person on the fee study committee. But if, you're, if anything is referred to the fee study committee beyond its regular scope of work, then um, it's a simple motion to add a third person. Bingo. Okay. So we could do that on an ad hoc basis. Yes. Yes. Good. <clears throat> Since it's just a single motion. So is that is that a friendly amendment to the? Uh, 
the motion? <laughs> I, I think what you could do is just do, based on this conversation, you could do a report back to okay. the city council that says we discussed this. We believe the fee committee is very important in the role it serves in the budget process. Mm -hmm. But absent special referrals, we feel it's sufficient with two counselors. But if there is going to be a special referral for a particular item, please add an additional member for purposes of that special referral. Something along that line. And that can be done by a simple motion of the council when with the referral, referral, when the referral is made. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we might also highlight that the, the fee study committee members can also request to have a third member added if something is referred to the committee for that for that particular discussion. Well, that's a little weird because if if one person wants it and the other person doesn't, then, <laughs> right? You know, that's <laughs> I, yeah. And the, I think it's just a, I think it's a vote of the council. And is is it fair to say that the mayor, according to the original motion? has the power to add a third at any point. I think it is fair to say. Um, but I, I will say that um, it, it was established for the purpose of just evaluating the budget and having a report back by June 7th of 1982. <laughs> and um, <laughs> they came back with a report back in May, May 3rd of 1982, with a new um, fee study. And I'll re read the report back so you uh, all understand. Um, a new fee schedule. Mr. Canny suggested giving this to the newly appointed fee committee. Council Councilman Foley moved that the compilation of fees be given to the fee committee, seconded and voted. Mayor Weeks asked that the manager also give a compila compilation of what of what this would do to increase revenues. This is what was discussed in the city council meeting. And, and that was the extent of further discussion that we know of. So and with all this, I'm going to withdraw my motion as long as the second agrees. Sure. OK. OK. So um, I'm happy to report back to the council um, at the next meeting, if that is amenable to everyone on the governance committee, that um, we have discussed this. And uh, the consensus is that the current structure is adequate to deal with its regular tasks. But um, if there is a need to um, address a task that fall outside of its regular order of business, that due to the original motion in 1982, the mayor has the ability to appoint a third member to the committee. Does that seem reasonable? It, we're kind of passing the buck to the mayor, but... Um. <laughs> And and we can say and the, or the council could could um, could suggest a motion to a pass to a third member. Could make yes, a yeah, exactly. Any counselor, could. any counselor. So, okay. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That will be my report back. Um, uh, that's it for new business. Um, we have had public comment already, and I don't see any new additions um, to the meeting. Uh, announcements. Uh, last thing for the committee. Uh, our next meeting is February 27th. Um, we're going to discuss donations policy, fee study, and continue any discussion around parks or planning around parks. Um, then that discussion continues on the 13th around donations policy. Well, hopefully by then we can get back to the administrative ordinance. Um, and uh, I pulled up conflict of interest to March 27th. Um, that would, that would mean that we have about a month, two more meetings, and hopefully we'll have something on donations policy um, at that stage. Um, is there anything else that anyone wants to share? Just wanted to compliment the chairman on bringing together everybody involved in green space and parks. I thought it was a great discussion, and we'll see where it takes us. Um, and you will all notice in your packet, and it's also included in the agenda, the scheduled meetings for the year, <laughs> so that we're all aware of when our next meetings are. Um, so uh, with that, I'll take a motion for adjourn. So moved. 
Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all.